Hey, you guys hear me? We can hear you, and now we can see you. All right, let me just, uh, sorry. You hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Now I hear you too. Great. Sorry about the delay. I live in fear that this is going to be absolutely nothing to do about cloud, nothing to do about fintech, and you and I are going to spend the next hour talking about racing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one is available too. What kind of racing do you do? I, I, I race in the Scandinavian Porsche Sports Cup. Oh, very cool. So, yeah. unfortunately, I, I just sold my car, and, and I look at um, what my next options would be, but... I was racing a fairly heavy modified Porsche Boxster. Oh, great. Yeah, I started with the uh, Caymans. I, I see you've signed up for Le Mans this year. Yep, this is going to be my 10th appearance at Le Mans. So oh. it's, a, it's a nice uh, parallel with the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of the race. In that case, so Villa, are you ready to go? Do not disturb is on. Phone is on silent. Uh, good to go. Good to go. And David, you are good to go. We're good to go. Good to go. Then we get started. Welcome to FinTech Daydreaming. The podcast that dives into the world of banking technologies and the ever-changing landscape of FinTech companies. We bring you real-life examples from global and local thought leaders, as well as experts working within the financial industry and seek out the best stories from the front lines of financial services innovation, where dreams of industry pioneers meet reality. Hosted by Paul Krogdahl and Ville Sontu. This is FinTech Daydreaming. We're back. Thank you to see you again, my good friends. And this time we're gonna have another fantastic discussion. So welcome to FinTech Daydreaming. I'm Paul Krogdahl, as always, I am your host for every other episode. You've probably noticed this trend by now. I step in every other episode and Villa, my partner in podcasting and FinTech uh, extravaganza is uh, a host on the other episode. So for this time, it's me and Villa, how are you? I'm good. I'm on the road again here. Greetings from uh, uh, nice and sunny Stockholm today. So not actually that far away, but still on the road. Uh, so with my my road equipment on as well. Uh, so yeah, yeah, uh, I yeah. think we'll manage quite nicely, though. Your road equipment, that means you don't have your fancy super duper microphone, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the only microphone I have is the one on my laptop, but it seems to be OK. So oh, it's, it's working OK. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, our guest with us today, David, you're uh, you're based in Copenhagen, I believe, right? Or you're Danish, at least. I am Danish and currently I am in Copenhagen. I spend time around the world, but uh, I do have a nice uh, microphone here in my uh, little <laughs> Copenhagen office. So that's good. So, I mean, this this is a true nordic uh inter-country nordic episode right we've got me sitting here in finland from norway we've got you villa who is uh finnish sitting in sweden and uh, we've got you david sitting in in denmark so it's we're covering all bases almost off there right so that's quite cool but for this episode we are going to go into the world of cloud and and david i i sort of pulled you in there a little bit how about you introduce yourself to our listeners tell Tell everybody who you are, where you've come from. Let's not go down the rabbit hole of passion of motorsports, but cover it off a little bit. And and most importantly, we always ask, what is your superpower? Sure. So my name is David Heinemeyer Hansen. I am a programmer and the CTO and co-founder at 37 Signals, where we make Basecamp, a project management tool, one of the very first SaaS applications premiered all the way back in 2004, almost 20 years ago now, still running strong. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also the creator of Ruby on Rails, which is a open source web development framework that also came out of those early days back in 2003, 2004 that I'm still working on. And um, I'm just excited about technology. I'm excited about programming. I'm excited about how we run web applications for whatever reason, that passion just touched me. I care deeply about how to build things for the internet, how to build things on the web in a way that's simple, cheap, accessible, fun. Um, and I've been dedicating my career to advancing those things, both with Ruby on Rails, with the applications that we build like Basecamp and our email service, hey.com, that we um, put out a few years ago. So 
all of these things kind of um, have led me to have a very intimate relationship with the, the full stack of things. Yeah. How we do things with the with the programming language, but also how we run things on the servers. Um, and this is where there's discussion about the cloud, um, whether we should rent servers or we should buy them really comes in, has been brought to the forefront in about the last year or so for me. Fantastic. We've been having, we've been having many of a couple of these very techie episodes in the past, and we always get good feedback on the techie episodes. So looking forward to having an interesting discussion about all things technology today as well. Oh, we surely are. And I, you pointed out a small thing there, you know, you're the inventor of Ruby on Rails and, and a lot of nerdy developer geeks out there are are really heavy users of it. What inspired you to to end up, you know, inventing Ruby on Rails? What was the the background behind that? Sure. So when I started working on Basecamp back in 2003, it was um, one of the first applications where we did not have a spec sheet from a client that dictated what technology to use. I'd been working with Jason Fried, my partner at 37 Signals, for a couple of years on client projects. And a lot of those client projects came with prescriptions. Oh, you have to use PHP or whatever it was at the time. And here we were starting to build a major application for ourselves, by ourselves, and we had free choice on what technology to use. And at the time, I'd been following the writings of the likes of Dave Thomas and Martin Fowler in various magazines and, and blog posts, and they were all enthralled by the Ruby programming language. Yep. And I thought if all these clever, really smart people would love to work in Ruby if they had the chance, I should give it a look now that I have free choice on what we should use for our new application. So I did, and I found this amazing programming language that at that time was already a decade old, but had essentially no traction in the West. And one of the reasons I think it didn't have any traction was it didn't have a specific niche where it was just really good. It was an amazing programming language, the best I've ever seen, something I fell head over heels in love with and has stayed in love with ever since. But it wasn't good at one particular thing. So mm -hmm. I thought, hey, do you know what? Here's this general purpose programming language. It doesn't really have a lot of tooling to build the kind of web applications I want to build. But you know what? I could just make those. I could just make the tools that we need to build Basecamp using Ruby. And I did that. Uh, build a handful of tools so that we could talk to a database, so that we could output HTML and glue it all together. And in about six months or so, I had a full toolkit that was an, good enough to build something like Basecamp. Mm -hmm. And we released Basecamp in uh, February of 2004. I kept tinkering with this toolkit for a few more months and uh, then released it all as Ruby on Rails. So it really came out of my need to use this amazing programming language to build things for myself. And it was kind of a byproduct that it ended up being something I could share with others. Which has gone on to, to great success. I mean, it just keeps growing and adoption keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? Yeah, it's kind of incredible. We've been going now for a good 20 years. Um, we have some amazing applications that's been built with Ruby on Rails. Um, everything from GitHub to Shopify, Twitter was started on Ruby on Rails, uh, Sendesk and Square and Airbnb. And there's just a ton of, at this point, huge multi-billion dollar applications that have been built on it, which is amazing to see. And I love it. But I also love the fact that Ruby on Rails from the beginning has been this one person framework. Yeah. It is not a toolkit just for huge companies to be slightly more efficient. I mean, I think that's wonderful that they are, but I really care about the the startups, the individuals, the people who are just getting going, maybe even individuals who don't think of themselves as programmers. Mm -hmm. I did a fair amount of programming before I even thought of myself as a programmer because I wasn't sure this was what I wanted to, to do. I needed something accessible that could get me the outcomes I was looking for, which was web applications. And Ruby on Rails continues with that mission to this day to compress the complexity of making modern web applications. Because really, to be honest, it is pretty complicated, or it can be at least, especially if you're trying to put everything together yourself. So yeah. Ruby on Rails is sort of uh, this omakase menu, as we like to say. The chef has prepared 18 delicious dishes that you can eat 
in small bites one at a time and you will end up with a glorious meal but you don't need to know what went into the preparation to appreciate the meal in time you'll learn hopefully and that's amazing but ruby on rails really helps beginners go all the way from hello world this is my first app to thinking that it's possible one day I'm doing IPO with my major tech company. And I love the breadth of that challenge um, and uh, continue to be excited about working on it 20 years on. So I think there we've outlined your superpower to uh, to the rest of the world there, right? So, <laughs> but that was, that was not actually the, um, the focus of the episode today. You in your company and you've written a couple of blog posts on this and we'll, we'll include that in the description underneath on you know how you compared to a lot of other fintechs and banks out there have done almost a full 180 when it comes to cloud you've most of the fintechs and banks are saying we're heading towards the cloud the cloud is the future everything is going to go to cloud that's where our future lies you've done a full 180 and said nah we tried it it didn't work we're moving back everything on premise, forget this cloud business. I mean, what motivated that change in direction for you? Yeah, so first of all, I'd say it's not that it didn't work, it's that the promises weren't true. So we run things right now. Uh, hey.com, our major new email service that we launched a couple of years ago is at this very moment entirely in cloud. It works great in the sense that, um, the application is fast and it's available and all these other things. What turned out to be a disappointment for me and for us was that the promises of cloud, that you could do more with less, less complexity, less cost, um, faster execution, um, smaller teams, all of these fundamental promises as to why we should pay a premium for renting computers in the cloud versus buying our own, turned out not to be true. And we tried for a very long time with very smart people, very hard to fulfill that promise or to see that promise realized in our business. Um, we've been on the cloud since the very early days, over a decade, I think now with uh, with S3, for example, and for many, many years on, on computing clouds. Yep. And the promise is just never materialized. We were not able to run with a smaller team. We were not able to do it at a lower cost. Um, there were some advantages in terms of quickly spinning up a bunch of things. The cloud is amazing at that. Like you can snap your fingers and all of a sudden you're renting a hundred beefy machines. That truly is a unique proposition, but it's also an incredibly expensive one. And for a kind of company like ours, a stable, long-running, profitable business that sells software for more than it costs to make, I know, really boring, profitable business one-on-one -on -one stuff, that um, advantage of being able to spin up 100 servers by the snap of your fingers was just not worth that much. It was not worth the, the premium. So... About a couple of years ago, I got pretty down on the whole notion that big tech was going to own everything. It mm -hmm. started really in earnest with the, the app stores on mobile, that we have this duopoly between Apple and Google. And I saw what that did to innovation and how it constrained it, particularly when you compared it to the internet, this wonderful, permissionless open platform that anyone can build for without having to beg a huge corporation for permission to exist. Mm -hmm. I thought like, do you know what? That's really depressing. But I hadn't truly made the connection to the fact that the cloud dynamic is quite similar to that until about a year, year and a half ago, um, when enough pieces of evidence have added up. First, our own uh, evidence, as I said, that these promises of the cloud just did not pan out. I kept hearing in the grapevine more and more companies having the same experience as us, this great promise of the, of the cloud not being realized. And them all thinking, oh, do you know what? It's because we're doing it wrong. Oh, we're not uh, cloud native enough. We're not cloud first yeah. enough. If we just try a little harder, eventually we will crack it, right? Um, and I thought, you know what? There's something that smells here. And it smells in much the same way as uh, uh, the um, emperor's clothes. 
allegory yeah. from uh, Hans Christian Andersen did, where everyone is talking like, oh, if you can't see the fine threads on the emperor, um, there's something wrong with you. And you needed basically a, a small boy to say, hey, look, he's naked. Um, and I kind of think that we're playing that role. That there are plenty of people who looked at the cloud and go like, oh, you know what? I don't actually see the promise here. I can't see what the what the magic is. But they stay quiet because they believe that everyone else believes that it is true. And we just stood up like the little boy in The Emperor Has No Clothes and said, he's naked. Um, so that realization that uh, the promises weren't true. And then the final sort of, um, I don't know death kneel into our relationship with the cloud was the computing of cost. That really was the major trigger that we started just looking at the amount of money we were spending in the cloud and going, wait a minute, this is actually absurd. This is absurd. Why are we spending so much money? Are, isn't this supposed to come down? Wasn't part of the promise with cloud that since you had these hyperscalers, they could buy hardware much cheaper than you ever could. They would pass on whatever savings, the industry would yield from advances in computer science onto you through lower prices. And we saw the exact opposite happening. That services got more and more expensive over time, particularly if you use the cloud native services, if you will, if you use stuff like managed databases or managed search, all the kind of stuff that's supposed to give you that promise of smaller teams and so forth, um, the prices were just astronomical. So. We started looking into all these factors. You know what? We actually highly prize our independence. We prize being a profitable company. We don't want to squander our resources. Um, what does it look like? Um, is, is cloud working out? And in the end, we came to the conclusion, it's not. Do you know what? It's not. And we should get out. We should get back to running our applications exclusively on our own hardware. Now, it goes to the story here that while we've run in the cloud for many, many years, we've never fully left running our own hardware too. So we knew what it entailed to buy and operate your own hardware in a co-located data center. And we knew it was nearly as hard as the cloud FUD has now convinced a depressingly large number of people that it is. Mm -hmm. Somehow there's this general amnesia in the industry that um, over the past year, it seemed, or past five years, let's say, five to seven years, it seems like everyone has forgotten what it takes to operate and own your own hardware. And they've gotten so terrified, petrified, in fact, of doing so that they're falling straight into the big cloud trap of saying, do you know what? You're actually not smart enough to do this. Leave this to the experts, which is of course just utter bullshit. The entire internet was built by people operating their own services and their own hardware up until five minutes ago. Every great big company that you know of on the internet almost to this day uh, started out that way. So this expertise is still there. It's not exotic. It's not risky. Um, we knew that. So I think it made it easier for us to make the choice of saying, do you know what? this cloud thing, we gave it a really big, good shot. I was even a cheerleader inside our own company for cloud. I bought this wonderful marketing pitch. I get to say one of the greatest of all time that um, not running on the cloud is kind of like producing your own power. Are you in the business of being a, a power producer? If not, why do you have a generator in your backyard? You should just buy power from the grid. Such a compelling argument. Um, that's a billion dollar argument that right there, if not a trillion dollar argument, I bought it hook, line and sinker. Uh, and it took quite a few years to deprogram from that brainwashing, but we finally did it. We're finally on the way out. And by the end of this summer, we will be virtually entirely out of the cloud. We will be saving um, at least a good million and a half dollars a year in expenses, quite possibly more than that. And uh, we will be left with with only S3 as the lingering footprint in the cloud by the end of this year. I, I so love we, we certainly certainly recognize this pattern of uh, Emperor's New Clothes in, in a lot of the fintech hype that we see. Uh, not going to get into the blockchain and crypto uh, debate, but I've heard very similar stories uh, on that front, uh, front as well. Uh, two questions, actually, uh, related to the topics you just mentioned. The... Uh, the number one indication that something is not really working was cost, as you said. So first question is, uh, uh, how long did it take uh, for you to go from this, hey, wait a minute moment to actually uh, concluding that, well, 
it actually doesn't make sense uh, to go to cloud. And then the second question, uh, uh, the uh, the cost being the driver, then you did a careful analysis on, on what is actually then causing that cost. So are you able to uh, maybe break down a little bit of what were the major cost drivers on cloud that you felt that you were able to get rid of when you're moving back to on-premise uh, deployments? Yeah, so I'll say that the cost question was more the tipping point um, than the instigator. I already had a, a variety of reservations around running in the cloud. Uh, first and foremost, this um, undermining of the fundamental architecture of the internet, that the internet was designed as a decentralized um, system with no single uh, small group of authorities that could uh, grant permission or take it away as to whether someone was allowed to be on the internet. Like that was really the the rotten core of it for me. But I thought, eh, do you know what? I don't know. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's going to whatever, go a different way. But as the cloud consolidation continued, that rot continued too. I mean, you see it whenever US East 1, the main AWS region is down and seemingly a quarter of the internet goes offline. Yeah. That was not what DARPA designed. DARPA designed a system that was supposed to survive nuclear attack and still keep on uh, running. So if we hand all over all our computing just to three companies, then we've really destroyed this wonder of the world um, in a way that just feels utterly tragic. But the cost thing, as it often goes, when it hits your wallet, is that moment where you just go like, okay, I have all these philosophical positions to where we're going, but um, now I realize like what the immediate day-to-day -day cost is. And I think part of it was we kept having this faith in the fundamental pitch of the cloud that the hyperscalers were going to reap um, sort of um, scale in a way that they could pass on cost savings that we could never approach, right? That that was a faith we had in it. And it just wasn't true. And I think really the trigger for this was in part what's happened with the advancement in CPU performance and storage performance over the last, let's say, three or four years. Um, the cloud really came into its peak form in a time when Intel was just stumbling. Intel basically went for, what, five years in the desert where their CPUs barely got any uh, faster, um, barely got more per performance per, per dollar. And then in the last three, four, five years, we've had this amazing um, a surgence of ARM technology. Apple in particular has driven that, and that has driven uh, a bunch of advancements from TSMC with the CPU um, efficiency and performance. So computers are just so much faster now. So we started running the numbers of how much compute can you buy from a company like Dell? How many cores can you get? How fast are there, those cores? And what does that cost to, to run in the cloud? And the comparison was really staggering. And I think when I look back on it now, I regret in some ways that we didn't do this um, calculation properly, like two and a half, three years ago. But sometimes like this reality and your faith, it takes us while to shake it, you have this vibe, you have this pendulum that says, oh, cloud is the future. Everything else is outdated. What are you doing stuck in the past, right? You have to break that spell first. Mm. Well, we finally broke it. And on our um, website, we have a full accounting analysis on everything we spend on cloud in 2022. We spend uh, $3,201 thousand five hundred and sixty four dollars on all our cloud services in 2022 that is more than a quarter of a million dollars per month and we broke that down per application we broke that down per service and just a few of those highlights are the things like the 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 main services of the cloud the ones they want to brag about all the time um, are the managed services and those are the ones that are most hideously expensive for example we spent half a million dollars on RDS, which is AWS's managed database service. Mm -hmm. We spent just over half a million on Open Search, which is their managed um, uh, logging and, and, and search platform, right? These are insane numbers. If you compare those numbers to how much computing power you could even buy from a tenth of that, 
it would be a really depressing picture, which is exactly what we did. So we took all of this spend and out of the 3.2 million that we have, um, about 2.4 were from these rental services that fall into the managed category. It was EKS, Amazon's Kubernetes service. It was the open search. It was RDS, um, Elastic uh, Elastic Cash. And then finally, we had about uh, $900,000 to S3, which I'll put that one aside because I actually think it's the best priced service and it's the mm -hmm. most cumbersome to replace, not least because the in or the egress costs of getting your data actually out of S3 is so astronomical. It's, <laughs> it's terrifying. But um, for the other things, the 2.4 million dollars worth of um, of spend every year on these cloud services. We did the calculation and it was an incredibly generous calculation, even if it's a napkin calculation, a very conservative calculation that we could take that 2.4 uh, million and cut it down to less than 900,000. And that would include buying all the replacement gear, amortizing that over five years, paying for all the services to host it and, and so on and so forth. Again, incredibly conservative, actually almost uh, misdirectingly conservative. I'd say the real number is, is, is more likely to be a $2 million a year savings that we will go from a budget that was 2.4 million in terms of the direct comparisons to a budget that's more like 400,000. And if you look at those numbers and you go like, do you know what? Um, we run a, a relative, well, I was gonna say small, that's not fair. We run a medium sized SaaS company. Um, and a million and a half dollars a year in extra bottom line is material. It's very material. I think for a lot of companies would look at those budgets and go like, actually, why would I pay, let's say, um, double or three times, or in some cases, five times as much to be in the cloud when I don't get these other savings that I'm supposed to get out of it. I'm not able to run things with a smaller team. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not actually able to do uh, things materially different. So. That was the analysis that really brought it down to me. Um, we've now put out all the cards on the table. We've been documenting the, documenting this entire journey of exiting the cloud with all the specific numbers. I just posted yesterday, we had just pulled a major application out of the cloud last week, uh, the original version of Basecamp, um, some of the performance numbers that we're getting. And, and even that looks amazing. It's not like the cloud gives you this um, incredible performance that you cannot replicate elsewhere. We actually saw that we got far better performance once we pulled out of the cloud. Um, but all this data just needs to be out there. And it needs to be out there so that people can run their own numbers. I'm not telling anyone what to do, whether to be in cloud or not being in the cloud. I'm telling them that if you do the calculation, if you run the numbers, you will realize why AWS in particular is the most profitable part of the Amazon empire, is the part of the Amazon empire that is generating, what is it, $40 billion a year in profits? Those profits don't come from nothing. They come from your pockets mm. and they need not. But is it, is it really that black and white? I mean, I I love everything you're laying out there. I'm, I'm just trying to think, as, as you, you highlighted, you are a SaaS company, right? So you are delivering, you're, you are developing and delivering a capability that you are offering out as a software, as a service. If you are a bank or if you're a fintech or you are a consumer of software, as a service capabilities, predominantly to run your business rather than being a software provider, does that change the dynamics partially? Does it still make sense for me to be a, a small startup company um, to to look at having everything in-house or is there still an advantage here, maybe even a, a cost advantage to, to take advantage of um, cloud capabilities? Because at the end of the day, your customers, whether you are running on-premise or in the cloud, to them, you are providing your service as a service, whether that is on AWS or on your cloud and you are charging for that underlying capability. So I'm wondering whether there is a fundamental difference in dynamics here as to whether you're a software company delivering a software as a service or whether you are a uh, more bricks and mortar style organization taking advantage of these capabilities delivered by companies like yours i think there absolutely is that distinction but software is eating the world i will absolutely argue that a bank today is a software company uh, a fintech 
Operation absolutely is a software company. But let's just take the bank example. Um, banks are not brick and mortar operations. They used to be. Maybe they still own some real estate. But what is more important to them? Branches or apps? Branches or operational software? Software by a huge margin. The, the value of a bank does not reside in the branches that it owns. It resides in its operating software. So I think banks is a great example of a kind of business that should cons or look at operating its software as a core competency. That is literally what it is. Software has long since eaten banks. And once you realize that, once you realize that you are actually a software company at heart in terms of your operational capacity, um, you should also realize that that is a core competency you should have in-house. Um, and also just because uh, banks should, uh, if anyone, be able to do the analysis, the financial analysis of whether it makes sense to rent or to buy. I would not trust any bank who can't make a proper financial analysis on the value of buying for long-term holdings in a stable business. I mean, what kind of bank doesn't have a, a three to five year outlook? I would be terrified of putting my money in a bank that can't uh, envision amortizing soft or, or hardware buys over five years, which is when the rent versus buy equation really just clicks out. Um, now, that being said, there are categories of companies where this doesn't make sense. If you are just a consumer of our base camp software, for example, you're just uh, sort of buying a service, right? Mm -hmm. You're not a, this is not core to your business. This is just a tool that you use. Yeah, of course, this, this hasn't, isn't even relevant to you. I am speaking to people who are currently buying huge volumes of compute directly from these rental clouds, as I like to call them. Um, those are the companies where this is relevant for. And if you are spending uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars buying compute directly from rental clouds, you are a software company. And the sooner you realize that, the better off you are. And once you realize that, you should absolutely run the equation as to whether it makes sense to rent or to buy your compute. Villa. You used to work in a bank. You 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 are a recovering banker, as you state it yourself. What's your view on that? Well, we used um, the oldest joke in the in the cloud business, especially when it comes to banking, is that uh, there is no cloud. It's just uh, just someone else's computer. And uh, to be fair to the banks, I think they have been very conservative uh, when it comes to the cloud, and they've been asking these questions from from day one. Of course, banks are now moving into the cloud for uh, for many reasons, and uh, I think we're addressing uh, today many of those uh, reasons and actually putting them in question. But uh, the banks always had this attitude that they, they really wanted to break it down, uh, really wanted to understand who actually sits on the data, who owns the data, where are the computers, who actually has access to these computers. Mm -hmm. So breaking it down from the security and risk perspective has always been like priority number one for banks. But the uh, these kind of uh, efficiency components, uh, they've been uh, less of a concern for banks uh, as of now. But I'm sure they're also waking up uh, to this uh, to this reality. The uh, uh, the question that actually occurred to me when you were describing uh, David the the journey uh, of you uh, come, going into the cloud and then co coming out of the cloud, uh, I, you obviously learned a lot of things. But how about your software? Uh, when you actually came out of the cloud, did you find that you had just done a lot of redundant things uh, to your software, or did it actually look, did you actually gain something from the journey of going into the cloud and back out? Um, I think that's what's really exciting about this cloud exit, and I just wrote about it this morning. That perhaps cloud exit is it's an invocative term, and I like using it because it really puts it on a on a pin here. But perhaps what we should be talking about is a rental cloud exit. And I posited this morning on LinkedIn and uh, my blog, the concept of sovereign clouds, which is also what some people call private clouds. But I just get the CIO white paper heebie-jeebies from that term, <laughs> private cloud. So <laughs> I like to call it sovereign clouds. This idea that um, we are still running, in many ways, cloud technology. We're running 
containers, we're running VMs, we're running um, much of the stack that the cloud has commercialized and into a, a rental agreement, even though we own our own digital footprint. So a lot of the work that we put into getting our applications ready for the cloud is work that we can reuse now that we're exiting the cloud. And that is in fact, one of the key components as to why we've been able to leave the cloud so incredibly quickly. It took us years to get into the cloud. And some of that is because um, cloud uh, setups, especially this idea that app servers are stateless was a major transition in the way you design the architecture of, of modern applications. But once you made that transition and you have stateless applications um, and, and you put your shared state somewhere else and you package things up into containers, that transition works just as well when you're moving on to your own hardware. So we were able to do things just enormously quickly. And we had to build very little new technology to be able to reuse all of those things that we've done. The main piece of new technology that we built is a deployment tool called MRSK, M-R-S-K. Um, you can find it on mrsk.dev that basically is just a wrapper around instrumenting Docker. So what we found was that the entire cloud world seems, um, or at least the rental cloud world has uh, come together around Kubernetes which is wonderful. It's great for them to have a tool for how to run a large rental cloud. It is though a horrendously complicated piece of technology if you want to run a sovereign cloud just for yourself, at mm -hmm. least at the kind of scale that we're doing it at, at a medium sized level. So we built this Merck tool instead, but other than that, everything else we could essentially reuse. I mean, that's the other sort of false premise here that the cloud has some magic juice, that they have some magic sprinkles. They put it, no, they don't. They run Postgres, they run MySQL, they run Redis, they run containers, they run all the same technology that everyone is running right now. They're just doing it in a rental format. Now, that's not to say that they don't have some neat wrapping around, I don't know, automated backups or something, but that is really marginal stuff compared to the core of the technology stack. So all the work we put into it really paid off. We've been able to move almost our entire suite of cloud applications. We had uh, seven applications in the cloud when we started this year. This year, in January, we started on sort of really in earnest on the move and we will be done more or less by the end of this month. That is an incredibly short transition period compared to how long it took us to get into the cloud in the first place. And that is enabled by the fact that the technologies now are so similar, which is why even though I speak of cloud exit, I'm really speaking to some extent about tr cloud transition, getting out of the rental clouds and getting into a sovereign cloud, a cloud you own yourself. So, so updating my notes here, uh, public cloud equals rental cloud, uh, private cloud equals uh, sovereign cloud. Okay, I think we like that. So, that, I think that sounds like a a good one. But I, I I've been thinking here for a minute. I mean, one of the the things, not so much about cost, but about maybe complexity and 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 availability. Villa, you mentioned uh, compliance, right? Regulations. Working in a bank, that always comes up. It comes up to the top, even when you're talking about the use of cloud, etc. Now, one of the things that I'm wondering about when you're doing your your exit here, David, when you look at banks, there are regulations that say to banks that they have to run, you know, at least two external um, duplications of their data centers, right? You need to have uh, redundancy, you need to have availability in, in uh, multiple locations. I think for most banks now in most jurisdictions, it is actually two additional places including re remind me here villa i think it's two additional places and then you need to have a third um backup location right so that means that you can't pull everything back into one physical location you have to pull everything back into multiple physical locations with that you've got like you said hardware you've got the cost of of that physical infrastructure, being the building, being the rent, being the electricity, being everything else. You go to, to any of the public clouds, you start talking about availability zones. Um, so being able to scale globally becomes a, a different dynamic. 
Is that something that was also taken into consideration, David, when you were doing your your exit or, you know? Yes, yes. And let me first correct one misconception. Um, when I talk about cloud exit, for all but the uh, largest internet sites in the world, we're not talking about people building their own data centers. Virtually no one does that below the scale of the metas and the apples and and the Googles of the world. You don't build your own data center. You rent um, space in a data center to put the hardware that you own. And that data center, those co-location data centers are responsible for things like owning a building, physical uh, security. Just like a bank very rarely um, will actually uh, sort of themselves be responsible for constructing their new headquarters, right? They will pay someone to do that for them. They don't have builders on staff. They don't know anything about uh, that kind of stuff. They don't have architects on staff. Same thing with data centers. You don't build the building itself. You don't maintain all of that stuff. You you rent space in one. And if you're a large bank, you might rent uh, a lot of space in one. But modern data centers are sort of constructions worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And there are companies that specialize that. And as such, you get an experience um, owning your own hardware in a place like that, that is actually surprisingly similar to what the uh, rental clouds are like. The lead time is a little longer. It takes a little longer from when you place your order for new machines for them to show up and be racked. It's on the order of a few weeks rather than a few minutes. So again, as we talked about, if you really have these hugely surging needs from time to other, the cloud, the rental clouds can be a, a really good option. Banks, probably the last possible place to have that. They have such boring, predictable businesses. They don't suddenly have 10 million new customers. You can't do know your customer verification at a at any rate like that. So they throttle the spikes that they see in their business already, which means that they're perfectly situated for this kind of setup. For us, having two data centers that we rent space in was enough. Um, would it have been materially more complicated if we had three? No, not really. Um, the same kind of coordination and, and how you do the backups between them and so on is actually the same, whether you are in a rental cloud or, or sovereign cloud. So I think we often overstate the technical differences between these things, that it is much more down to the financial um, differences, the ownership differences, the independence differences of owning your own stuff and then putting it in a data center that someone else operates. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's how you should look at it. So I don't think that the competence levels or the difficulty levels for a bank that needs to be present in three different physical locations is all that different if you look at rental clouds versus sovereign clouds. So actually you're, you're, you're saying that once it comes to the, the networking, the very low level infrastructure, that's actually something you're still renting from, from a provider. Oh, everyone is. No one has their own cables across the Atlantic. No, so, no, no. I mean, that, that's, I, and I think that is the distinction that it's really important to make is that um, sort of that, that harness of what makes the internet tech, um, that is, that is, um, all part of sort of the same infrastructure, whether you are in a rental cloud or, or a sovereign cloud. And the same goes for things like, like power, right? Um, power is actually the original example, funnily enough, the original analogy that people were using to push clouds, but there it works, right? I'm not asking banks, oh, you should have your own coal power plant such that you can supply your own thing. We're not talking about homesteading in the uh, um, American West style where you have no connections to the rest of society at all. No, no, plug into society, but own the core competencies and the core pieces of, of infrastructure that you need to operate your business. Very interesting, very interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm still thinking there is a hybrid model here going forward. So I think most organizations will not say that it's either one or the other. They're going to find a little bit like you you alluded to. I mean, yes, you've you will stay with with certain elements on on AWS. And I think well, ultimately more... we won't. Ultimately we won't. It's just a, a timing period. I mean we're getting out of the rental clouds entirely. By the right. time we are done, we will spend zero dollars on the rental cloud and all our monies on our sovereign cloud. But 
I still accept the, the the setup here is that other people could come to to other conclusions on that, and there are certain kinds of services where the math isn't as egregiously offensive as it is on some of these things we've covered, like managed databases or managed search or, or whatnot. And I think file storage, for example, is a good example. If if you don't have these other philosophical uh, oppositions or, or objections to rental clouds, then you might just go like, you know what, uh, S3, for example, we'll just stay with that and we'll continue to use that even though we will build out the rest of our sovereign cloud on owned hardware. So I could see that being true, but I think sometimes this this hybrid thing too is a little way of, of soft peddling things. Um, and I get that that is appealing to sort of the cloud native approach, this idea that, um, oh, it's a sort of, we're just going to mix and match of it. I tend to say that you should at least run the math yourself. And I think more people than not will come to the conclusion on those calculations that their split will probably also be zero dollars in rental clouds and all the dollars in sovereign clouds. Now, doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be dogmatic in any way, shape, or form. You should run your own numbers, but the numbers that we've run um, still point towards the fact that if you have a stable business with stable demand and you can visualize amortizing equipment over five years, which banks certainly can, mm -hmm. then there are not a whole lot of compelling arguments left for why you should use rental clouds at all. Fantastic discussion, as we say on this um, podcast. Time flies when you're having fun, and we're heading rapidly towards the end of our allotted time for, for this discussion. I'm wondering, David, um, is there anything else that you wish we had covered or any questions you were hoping we would ask? No, I think this is great. It's a great discussion, and I like taking offset in these conservative businesses like banks because I think they are actually the ones <laughs> who kind of got snookered by this whole uh, cloud pendulum. They waited so long um, for to, to jump in wholehearted that the pendulum has actually started swinging back the other direction. And they're like, oh yeah, now we're finally ready to go all in on cloud. And the um, equation now looks different than it did a few years ago. And so I kind of feel a little bad for all the people who wrote a trillion white papers and presented things to the board over the years to finally get permission to go into the cloud. And like now, I mean, all the cool kids are heading for the exit. Um, not that this is about cool or not cool. This is actually about fundamentals. This is actually about boring things. This is actually about things that the banks should have been leaders on, right? Like I would actually expect that the banks be the one who said like, actually, no, this doesn't, we, we do spreadsheets. We're really good at spreadsheets and we've done the spreadsheet and it doesn't add up. We should not move into the cloud. But I found that uh, bank technologists, like all technologists are herd animals just like most people are most of the time. And they will go with the herd. And the herd was uniformly going towards cloud and they felt pressured probably into going with it. I guarantee you that there's a bunch of people who sit with secretly feeling like, yeah, I can't actually knew that. I knew it didn't really add up, but what were we going to do? Whatever, the, the C-level suite had gotten a, a great presentation from Accenture or whatever telling us that cloud is the future and was pushing so hard for us to do it. So what are you going to do? Are you going to stand up against the, the tide of all hype? Uh, no, you're just going to get uh, washed over, right? So here we are, though. I think the um, vibes are changing. I think the pendulum is swinging back. I think there is now room, again, to make a recent calculus in a spreadsheet as to whether it makes sense to your business or not. And I think more businesses than not, especially the conservative kind, certainly the banks will revisit their decision to go to the cloud because it actually does not make sense for a lot of people. Fantastic. Thank you. Really, really exciting discussion. I wish we could have continued having it and gone into so much there for us to unpack. I wanted to talk to you about industry aligned clouds like you know Microsoft and, and IBM are now doing uh banking clouds and those sort of things but we are rapidly running out of time and one of the things we we like to do on these uh these episodes is uh ask our guests to share a joke i don't know if you've got a joke or not if you haven't then villa will step in for you this time but um you i'll, know, I'll take the sun double on this one 
<laughs> stunt double, Villa, stunt double. Have you got a joke for our listeners? Oh dear, I've been dreading this moment. I've been having this <laughs> in reserve for a while, so and it's been in reserve for a good reason. But let's see how this works out. Yeah. Uh, so we've been uh, we've been talking about change. Actually, this time change towards maybe going a little bit back uh, from where, where we actually ended up with with clouds. So maybe this question then is is relevant. So what do you call a man with a head full of change? No idea. Headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay <laughs> thank you yeah wow 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 thank you for that one thank you very much um on that high note uh david if our listeners want to uh get in contact with you talk to, more to you about your experience of exiting public cloud how can they reach you i have my personal website dhh.dk that has links to everything and then i'm also on linkedin and twitter at dhh Fantastic. David, thank you very much for joining us and good luck for you this year at uh, the 24 Hours of Le Mans. I will turn on and follow you for sure uh, during that race, but that's only because I'm a passionate racing driver myself. Thank you for joining us and to our listeners out there, thank you for joining us for yet again uh, another fantastic discussion. I hope you really enjoyed this episode like Villa and I did. If you did, leave a comment hit the subscribe button, share our fantastic podcast with all of your uh, friends and network. Um, it helps us to grow. And the more we grow, the more we want to do this content for you. Villa and I will be back in two weeks time with another episode. But until then, this has been Fintech Daydreaming. This is Fintech Daydreaming. <laughs>